means the contractor takes all the risk of maintaining our trees. Within that contract, there is a list of engineering words that they are prepared to undertake within the contract to make sure that those trees can be uh, safeguarded and can remain. Right? If then, if the engineering works is over and above and beyond that, which means quite substantial engineering, words, like widening roadways, like realigning pavements, like very serious engineering, uplifting pavements and re, re, relaying pavements, but that substantial works that is over and above the contract. And that's why these figures come in. Because out of those 5,000 trees, 3,000 have been replaced, there's around 2,000 left. And we've worked out, if, if of those trees that are within those categories that need replacing, and the, the, the council could do that with this type of substantial engineering work, but it's not within the contract, it would mean the council has got to pay for it. So we asked the officers to look at, is it possible to, to find the funding to save these trees? We want to save the trees, we're the green city. So that's where the costs come from. Now some of them, like for example, 100, it's impossible. Because the only real way you could say some of these trees was to either close a road or just completely re relay and rebuild the old street and the pavement. So it, it's just impossible. And then there are around 200 would need large engineering works. Large engineering works. And this is where the two, two different figures come up. Because you, you can't say until you've assessed it exactly how much it would cost. But you get a minimal cost. On experience, you get a minimal cost. And you get a maximum cost. So it could be anywhere between £50,000 or £100,000. And they, they, there's one in example, a, a, an elm tree in the city that needs this work. And they have looked at the cost of that. And it's somewhere between a minimum of 50 and a maximum of 100. And that's an example. So what we're saying is the number of trees that are in those categories, we've costed it up, because you can't say exactly, some trees will be between 3,000 and 5,000. So we've costed them up, and that gives us a range to save all those trees in those two categories, which is what the campaigners are demanding that we do, is in between 14 million pound minimum and 26 million pound maximum. But highly likely to be somewhere in between. But it could be up to 26 million. Absolutely. If Nick Clegg is seriously saying that he was not aware of the content of this contract, then his local Liberal Democrat party is misleading him. Or he was aware of it, but he didn't know the detail. Now, we know in the past, Nick Clegg has done ridiculous things like sign the white paper on the NHS restructure and then came out later and said, well, I actually didn't read the detail. So either way, he wasn't aware of the detail, right? Now, for the purposes of every member of the public in this city, I make it absolutely clear that this contract was agreed around 2009. The inception was in 2007, but around 2009 when we're pulling the detail together to work out how much funding was needed, and that's where you got to the 1.2 billion for this contract. Now that document is called the Sheffield Highway Maintenance PFI Project, descriptive document, right? 2009. And the foreword in there was the leader of the council at that time, Council Holdsworth, who is now Lord Spurgeon. And in this, in this, in this contract, it says, under highway trees, a significant improvement in the standard of tree maintenance will be required, with large numbers of overmature trees being replaced by more appropriate species. Now, of the 36,000 highway trees, what would you consider to be large numbers? Well, I'd actually think large numbers out of 36,000 would be somewhere a minimum of 10, maybe, actually. But actually, it's around 5,000. Because what we did is we, when we came into power and we started the contract, and I signed it in 2012, we said we need to maintain as many trees as possible. So we went from an initial, in 2007, estimation of there's around three quarters of our trees are quite mature. 
and we know over time they will need to be replaced. And we're down now to around 14-15% of trees being replaced. So for Nick Clegg to say he didn't know anything about this contract, then either he doesn't know the detail or his Liberal Democrat colleagues are not telling him the truth. And secondly, Nick Clegg did not secure this contract. This contract was secured in 2009 under a Labour government. What Nick Clegg did is in 2010, during the coalition, when he joined the Tories, what he didn't do was not stop the contract. The contract was already in place, just like other contracts, like ours.
pet story is something that came to my attention on Twitter because there's just so many people talking about the trees in Sheffield. And uh, what's going on, we thought. Well, with an estimated 2 million trees, Sheffield holds a strong claim to be Europe's greenest city. But a row has broken out between residents and the council over its decision to cut down thousands of trees as part of a £2 billion road improvement scheme. The council say the trees need to go because they're old and they're damaging the city's roads and pavements, they're trip houses and so on. But lots of residents of the South Yorkshire South Yorkshire line streets are furious that so many old trees are being cut down. Tree protests have sprung up across the city after thousands of people signed a petition to save the trees on one street. And last month, over a hundred residents came out to protest in a bid to save one of the country's last elm trees. So we're going to speak to Carly Mountain, who's a campaigner with Save the Trees in Sheffield. Also there is Place, PLAC, which is the department responsible for improving the infrastructure of Sheffield, Simon Green. So, first of all, Carly, you tell us what's going wrong. Well, hello there. Hi. Hi. Um, we feel that feel um, the idea that the trees are um, coming to the end of their natural life is actually misleading. Um, trees, actually mature trees, give the most in terms of ecosystem services. Um, and the, the, the idea that the, a replacement programme, which is going to be a, an investment for our future, is also greatly misleading. The saplings that are being planted have a very high fail rate. Um, and they cannot... Right, uh, very good evening and thank you very much for coming. My name is Lawrence Penn and I'm President of the Geography Society here at Sheffield Hallam. We're all very uh, privileged to live in Sheffield as it is well, renowned, uh, well known the world over for being one of the greenest cities in Western Europe. But sadly, this, uh, this reputation is a risk after the privatisation of the local authority services. Um, so to tell us more, uh, we have got Ian Rotherham here. I'm sure you're joining him. You'll join us in welcoming him to Shepherd Hunt. Thank you very much. Okay, good evening, everyone. Uh, there is more of the, the clips on my blog, so you can see that it's full of glory. Uh, we have other stuff from uh, my friend Ron and Brian, who was reading them, so I'll have a little apology on my blog. I'm just going to bad language because he's very upset. So, um, I've been asked to just point out that we're not expecting a fire alarm, so if there is uh, an alarm go off, please exit safely here or at the top of the stairway. Thank you. Okay, um, I'm going to cover a lot of ground, so I can't do it in great detail, but I want to talk about the Shepherd Street Trees debacle and avoidable crisis. Um, the clips I've shown you. Some of the balance, some of the ideas, some of the thoughts from the different sides. Um, I've been involved in this situation for a long, long time, and I have to uh, own up to having a previous life as a city's ecologist many years ago and being involved in writing these strategies for trees and woods and other such things. One of the amazing things is that trees and woodlands, for which Sheffield is famous. Um, are hugely evocative. Years and years ago, we were trying to engage communities in uh, their local woodland, particular project that Lynn, when was that a second ago, Lynn uh, <laughs> was involved in in the Stocksbridge Steel Valley project. And you couldn't get people, it was volunteers, the project was new, and the project officer decided to copy the local woodland. And the lynch mob turned out to be on the And they all became his, his volunteers when they realised what he was doing, that he was good husband with. Um, you know, bluebells are one of the evocative, identifiable species that we have. Most people, you know, if you stand and ask people in the street, how many wildflowers do they know? There's not that many. But bluebell is one of them. <coughs> I made a bit of a prediction. It was a national conference 2010 held in London on street trees. Uh, and I was interested in issues of ownership. Like, oh, whose trees are these, which I'll return to later. Uh, and this was a mixture of professionals who were involved in trees, but also tree professionals. And I arrived slightly late, having come down the train from London. I knew the people that were organising it. And I came in, and you could cut the atmosphere with a knife. And it was really interesting, the separation between the tree officers and community leaders who 
out these with their trees to work with the community, and the other tree officers who look out these with their trees as professionals, and they would do what they like, and they don't want to talk to anybody. And that was really cool. This is really strange. At that conference, I pointed out that we were in the throes of the austerity for whatever physical reasons. Uh, but once again, and having been here in Sheffield in the early 1990s, um, been through austerity previously, once again we're in a position of drastic cuts in public services, and especially in medical funds provision. My comment was that this would leave extreme trees, especially vulnerable, well, since they have no voice, they can't speak, at least not to most of us. Got a few friends at this um, But Woodlands, for example, often had friends with them. Group, say. Yeah, they had people that uh, campaigned for them, and it just seemed like the street trees were out there on their own and they were very vulnerable. And the street trees also become very political because of issues which have emerged since 2010. But I raise issues of accountability, of ownership, of responsibility, how I do describe as local environmental democracy, all of which I felt were under threat and potentially made this resource very vulnerable. This is 2010. Remember before um, the situation happened in Sheffield. The background is that Sheffield is, as we've already heard, the claim to be the greenest industrial city in Western Europe. It has 18 or more Asian woodlands and Asian woodland sites. It's famously green and treed suburbs. Sir John Betchman, former poet laureate, uh, wrote lyrically about the western suburbs of Sheffield and their trees. And if you have urban trees, they do need management. They need TLC, tender living care. And there are various strategies. If you go around cities in the UK and in Europe, you can see the different strategies brought to bear to manage trees. Because they're in the urban area, the urban catch and the urban environment, they have to be managed very carefully. But the emphasis on, is on management. And there you can see a, a tree that's been pollarded, it's been reduced by it's growing out, it's um, producing a lot of very rapid growth, and you have to keep managing that. It's what you do, it's you know, how we get the benefits from these things. If you go to Nether Edge, Sheffield, it really is an amazing suburb because you are really in the urban forest. This was the elm tree that was referred to um, in the video with Council Bill. And it's under the elm, it's disease resistant, it's still there, most of our elms have gone. And there's a fantastic event held uh, by the local community leaders and groups in the summer to celebrate both this tree and its population of very rare white letter hair streets that are lost to life. I'll come back to that. Just to remind you, I know you all know all this, but the benefits that we have from trees, which we sometimes Cycle. Obviously, green and high quality environments with noise reduction, visual enhancement, things will look better. Moderation of extreme weather and climate proofing, particularly in urban areas, which is becoming increasingly important. The big trees, and I understand they're the big trees, not the trees, but the big trees, can drop some of peak temperatures anything from 5 to 7 degrees centigrade. If you are touching 35 degrees centigrade as a peak summer point, you know, that's, that's the difference between that going up to 40 something. And without being over dramatic, at 40 something people die. Vulnerable people in society. So there are issues there uh, with climate proofing. The big trees can compensate, if not completely proof, as against some of the uh, temperature extremes. They also, of course, provide shade um, and they reduce heating and um, air conditioning rules in buildings. <coughs> trees hold water, water from rain, uh, hits the tree canopy, some of it is re evaporated in the atmosphere, some of it uh, is slowed in the slope to the ground. But either way, what it does is the trees actually help to slow the flow. They start to uh, mitigate for uh, some aspects of uh, flood risk caused by excessive rain. They remove particular pollution, particularly along the highways. This is a huge benefit that we get. And again, I'll give you some values for this later on. We get enhanced house values. I 
and a desire to live in the location. That has a real benefit to a city like Sheffield in a, an economy where you can locate anywhere. Sheffield heroically goes to have water for coal, wood for charcoal, uh, and iron ore. You don't have to be geographically located where the resources are there, you can be anywhere. Sheffield's key for inward investment in the future is going to be its green nature, its location, its specialness. So we need to conserve that and value it every other island. <coughs> and also ecology, biodiversity, habitat, connectivity, and continuity. Again, trees are uh, hugely important. I mean, in the 1990s, produced a nature conservation strategy for Sheffield, and that set out green corridors, but also uh, areas where we wanted to join and strengthen existing green corridors. And a lot of those were along highways with big trees. They were where we should be strengthening the links. History, heritage, and connectivity of the past. Because I do environmental histories, I'm very uh, passionate about trees and tree heritage and how they tell us where they are and who they are. They give us local distinctness, give us cultural identity. They create a sense of place. They are something that you can touch and will take you back to the past. So you have some idea of who you are, where you are, and when you are. For the urban community in particular, trees are hugely important. You gain a sense of seasonality, which often in our cocoon urban environment we are lacking. They provide benefits to the community and individual health, physical, mental, and spiritual. Massive savings to the NHS linked to the therapeutic values of trees and woods. But how much do we value that? This was great because this was a, the Netheridge uh, celebration, and we had people from all over the country, experts on elm trees came in. Uh, the Wildlife Trust were there, the Nether Age Group were there, Stag were there. Um, and you could go over to the top of it, they have even hired um, a York open top double decker bus. And you could take it up and you could see, we actually saw the white letter hair speed bus device in the tree canopy. And you got up there and actually into the top of the bus and you were in an urban forest. You've got big trees on the street, you've got big trees in gardens, and you can see how that functions ecologically. So you might ask, why is the tree? Which is completely healthy. Uh, why is that going to go? Well, if you look at it, and it's causing <coughs> remedial damage to the pavements, isn't it? And to actually save it and engineer a solution around it, apparently, according to FCC and Amy, uh, be somewhere over £50,000 for tell you, to remediate that. An independent hires engineer. Two and a half thousand, three and a half thousand, easy to <coughs> That tree is perfectly healthy. It is not near the end of its natural life. It could easily live another 150 years. <coughs> Don't read the detail. Um, basically, it's just I know it's probably do worry about trees. If people are near, too close to trees, if they're shaded by trees, if they get Leaf litter, uh, impacts of clay movement on buildings, branch fall by winds, warm milk from nest and nourished to birds, or noise from birds, um, then people do get concerned. So it's not something that can say, oh, nobody thinks trees have bring any negatives. But the question then is, if you are going to deal with things, is how do you deal with them? How do you actually alleviate them? Um, and is the solution simply to remove all the trees that you think might be causing the problem? And if we look at clay movement, for example, if you actually remove a tree because, oh, this tree is actually pulling water out of the ground and you may get clay-based heat. Well, if you actually remove the tree, you're going to get a change in the water table. That tree's been there for 100 years, maybe the same life as the building, the two have grown up together. Remove the tree may well cause catastrophic movement uh, because you're taking the tree out and, you, again, you've affected the soil water. And, of course, they stump by the actual stump, but the roots are still there on the ground. Eventually they will decompose and they will collapse, so you will get a degree of substance. What happens, and this happened with actually with badgers, I'm not, I'm not about to badgers, I'm being told to stick to trees. But uh, David Cameron famously says, when I'm questioned about gassing or shooting badgers, well, we've got to do something. 
Being the decisive tells us about world. We have to be seen to be decisive. And this is a danger under this, this kind of damage and this sort of pressure. I, mean, I had meetings with a, a councillor in the early days of uh, the tree problem. And he said, oh, well, my post box is full of uh, people that don't like trees. I kind of get no letters from people wanting trees. I get lots from people who um, want to get rid of them. So I think our approach to that as well, I'm sure we can change that. We can get more letters from people that like trees. But you get the pressure to do something, even if that is inappropriate. Um, and it's very easy to build this sort of unspoken consensus for removal, even though it's uh, deeply and seriously flawed. Some of these trees are problems. You know, this is a small-ish cherry tree planted in the 1950s, and they, they just used the wrong cultivars. They used the trees that are growing, sending out roots all over the place. They were really quite interesting trees, or they were, they've gone now, but uh, um, they are not appropriate for that situation. And yes, if you want to make a tree like that, you may replace them with a, a better variety, perhaps. Um, there are issues. And trees fail, and when they fail, they fail catastrophically. But hey, this was not the fault of the tree, this was another corporate problem. Uh, quite a few years ago now, probably 1990s, Yorkshire Cable, if anybody remembers that. Mm -hmm. And they cut along the highway, they cut through the tree roots, but the tree doesn't die immediately because it takes a few years for the infection to get into the roots. And lo and behold, it gave way. When you look, you can see where the roots have been cut, you can see where the infection got in. And it was completely to do with the fact that this 180 year old beech tree just near Ecclesford Woods had had its roots cut. Uh, unnecessarily. Chris Baines, who I showed in a later picture, actually got a government policy change for them, got them to uh, change the way that they cut the trenches for cable, so they just had to go under and round the roots. But for this one, it was too late. But the problem there is you, you set in train with the wrong action, a process that takes five or six years to actually come to fruition and trees fall down, by which point the people that have done the, the vandalism are the ones who have That's the kind of thing that we're dealing with. Oh, dear, he's lifting the pavement. Terrible. If you walk from St Pancras Station uh, down the main road in London, you pass trees that are four times the size of that growing in the pavements. And yes, they lift the pavements. So you engineer around it. They have little metal grids. They have uh, flexible paving. They have all sorts of things. You don't have to remove the tree. You just have to get the engineering right. So, yeah, it does that. And when I discussed this with Amy, the, the contractors, I said, well, okay, so you're removing these old trees and you are planting some what we call forest trees, so big trees as replacements in some cases. Are you planting them into tree pits? Because the problem here is that these basic pieces are stuck into a hole in the ground, but they're not into constructed tree pits. And the Americans and the Europeans have very nice tree pits, which will allow the tree to grow on the ground. No, we can't afford to do that. Okay, so in a hundred years' time, when this tree is now grown up, and it's now a decent tree, we'll have to cut it down again, because this tree will be lifting the pavement. So, things started to crack off in about the summer of 2013, I think it was. Uh, because I do work with the radio, with the radio of Sheffield and the Sheffield Star, I was going to be con contacted by concerned groups and individuals. I should have said there's some information at the front here for you to take away. There's also some books with a robin on the front, which are all about somewhere, and there are piles at the front. Please take them away. Um, there is an email in there to contact me. Don't use it, it doesn't work anymore. Then. This is what we did some years ago based on my Sheffield Star newspaper. But please do take away. It does say 9.95 on the back, and I have no people this time you take and give them the Christmas presents. Feel free. I don't mind. Um, anyway, I did a lot with the local media, and I was contacted by a lot of people. And this seems to be a, a real issue. So I arranged to meet Amy to find out what was going on, um, and I raised issues and concerns. And really, I was reflecting to them the concerns of local communities, the fact that there seemed to be no effective consultation. There was a lack of effective engagement. There was a difficulty, particularly when people felt that something was happening on their doorstep, they couldn't contact the contractors. Um, there seemed to be a lack of a vision or any sort of strategy. People just told, this is the plan for your area, let's deal with it. 
Um, the approach seems to be in isolation from all the green policies or strategies that have gone before. So I have raised to be as and that's some of And our race issues are also about you know, the City Council promised to talk about existing strategies, things that have been democratically consulted on and agreed with the policy for the local authority and for the community. And they said they were unaware of any early policies or strategies and they were working in isolation other than the highways issues and their contract. And what then seemed to be the case was that if you spoke to the contractor, they said, we can't change anything we're doing because we have a contract with the local authority. And if you spoke to the local authority, they said, well, we can't do anything to change this because we have a contract with the contractor. <coughs> so this didn't seem very help. They were not even prepared to set up a direct health line for customers. So, because if you have tried to get through the general health line, because it's just, it's just a shame to see the council health line, uh, after about 15 minutes, you do really want to end this all. Um, and you've probably not got anywhere. But if you do get through to somebody, you've got someone who is now not the person you want to speak to, because you want to speak to a man who deals with people with chainsaws and can stop them or tell you why what they're doing. Uh, and you can't, you get some poor individual on a health line. I don't know. So I did offer to help, I did offer to give some guidance because I've worked in the authority, I knew a lot of the policy, I knew a lot of the communities, I was prepared to act as a kind of intermediary uh, that I thought was rejected. And one of the issues I had was, you know, we've got things like the nature conservation strategy, and we've got countryside strategies, and we've got woodland, uh, woodland policy, and we've got various other things. But whatever we're doing had to be in the context of these because this is what the public of Sheffield have been told over several decades. One of the particular issues which uh, I was concerned about were heritage trees, because my interest in environmental history. Um, trees as markers of time and space and events. Uh, and in this case, this is in the Cleveland Valley, um, and the Council of Safety Sheffield. And it's a field boundary tree from the countryside now taken into the urban area. It's not close to a building particularly, it's the other side of the road, it's not a busy road. Oh dear me, it had a tiny bit of rot in it, therefore that was a death knell that one. And despite a lot of people objecting, the tree disappeared. Uh, there's another one, so I'll show you in a second. Uh, and at one of the meetings, I said, well, what, you know, what's your policy on heritage trees? This is to the senior person from Amy, and the leading councillor at the time. And they kind of just, I had no idea what I was talking about. So I said, you know, heritage trees. And I just kind of explained, oh, right, okay. <clears throat> um, I'm gone. I haven't really thought about that. And then he said, well, for the one that had been felled, which I'll show you in a second, um, which was probably somewhere between three, four, four hundred and fifty years old, uh, someone actually got it in close to being dated, and I'll put them in the picture here. Um, and to put it in context, we don't have that many big oak trees like that in Sheffield because we have coppice woods, but we don't have that many big old oak trees. So a 400 year old oak tree is a brilliant one, and the city has policy is that oak trees over 175 years were supposed to be conserved as uh, sort of veterans. So we said, well, I know what we'll do. Um, we'll put your green flag up to say, here wants to trade a tree. I did not ask because we're going to plant you some more. I said, well, so we've got lots of trees in Sheffield going to a wood. You can plant as many as you want. It's not going to replace the ones that you cut down. That's a 400-year-old tree. It will be a unique genetic type. It's a local variant. You can't, you know, it'll be 400 years till the next one. So plant one. Oh, and yeah, we'll plant you one, but it won't be the same place. Hang on. So uh, he planted me a sapling of which we have I was in the woods. Uh, it's not in the same place, but I get a green flag. That's great. That, that's the tree in question. It's a hugely popular tree in a deep car in Sheffield. Um, and the locals were very upset about it. And the tree had survived a huge storm the previous autumn. It was still there. It hadn't shifted at all. It wasn't dangerous. And if it was having problems, because it's now been urbanised, it's been taken from a very nice rural environment. And Put into you know the pavements being built around it, houses being built around it. Yeah, the tree might be suffering. So you can reduce it, you prune it, you manage it. TLC. 
About the same time, other things were cracking off. This is just to give you an idea of the scope of this. It is not a whole Asian organization nation trees. This is a roundabout planting on a uh, 1960s thing on the arterial root of the from Meadowhead roundabout. Uh, and you can see in the far corner what this looked like. It's a look at the top there. Uh, it was um, just a nice green space that Greece gave us. Two or three on the roundabouts. I think it had quite a bit of wildlife in it. There's certainly foxes in there, and maybe there been badgers passing through, and possibly roe deer, parts of birds using it. Um, and the report came through, oh dear me, it's, uh, well, there's some willows in it which are dead, or dying, or dangerous, they've got rocks. Well, I see these willows would have had to leap from where they were across grass into the road. So that you see, even if they fell, they would have had to really leap out. And, and you know what's worse? There's actually a self set birch trees and sycamore trees, and we can't have that. In other words, these trees came by themselves, they seed themselves out, they grow really well, Ooh, but they're not official trees. And the term was then coined, but we can't give you trees fit for purpose. Has <laughs> anyone seen a tree not with that? I'm not this one in Misty Pisley. Anyway, the thing with Manhattan Roundabout, which was interesting, was no one could tell me. How much it cost? Um, and I was interested because I've, I've worked for local authority. I, I wanted to know the, the capital cost, how much was spent on this removal of trees to create the thing in the middle there, the no trees, a few planted trees that died. I wanted to know how much was spent on that, but I also wanted to know what the, the, the maintenance budget was before and afterwards. Because I know the maintenance budget before would have been almost nothing because there's not going to be safe. Whereas now you've got a short mode area. And that will be costed. So I said, well, I want to know. I, think I understand this in the public domain. Um, I'd like to know what the budget was. Oh, it's commercially sensitive now because it's a public private partnership. There are no rights there. Never mind democracy. What actually happened, the reason that uh, the trees were held was nothing to do with danger or hazard or anything. If you see the picture in the middle bottom, it was to store the dirt when they were doing some work. And that was the only reason, is to store the dirt and then to put a traffic security camera in the middle of the roundabout. Mm -hmm. But they didn't admit that. And I'm kind of I mean, we said more if they just said, this is what we're doing, it, we, you know, we're digging the dirt, we need to store it, it's cheaper to do it that way, uh, we're not bothered about the trees. So I can almost live with that, I can disagree with it, I can respect it. To lie and to hide behind uh, inappropriate legislation, I think, is not acceptable. This is another one. Well, Jones had been very involved in his own house, Ed's Woods, Sheffield's own settlement <coughs> of ancient woodland, and now within the boundary of the ancient woods, albeit on an disturbed area, but is in the Sheffield site, as you can see in the bottom corner there. The red bit is a Sheffield site, it's a green corridor, it's ancient woodland, it now has a fire station. And I was told that the, the woodland is now better protected because it has a fire station <laughs> with a green roof, so it's all okay. The local people who from a fairly less affluent area of Sheffield who walk their dogs there, take their children there, watch butterflies there, a bit you know, upset. I did ask whether they would have access to the green roof to look across the campus and take the kids out, but didn't get a response to that. So what I did, uh, as easy as you start to crack off, was an initial attempt to dialogue and discussion, uh, public event with the Green Party, and other active seats, you say, and concerned citizens. Two day conference with national level speakers, uh, which my colleague Ian Crow uh, was one of the participants on the speakers. Um, establishment of local action groups, networks, of specialist experts, calls and lobbying and direct action, media campaigns, and also questions about legal issues and other issues. Green Party event, we were actually packed for an evening down at St Mary's Community Centre. Um, urban tree destruction and interaction now, that was 2013 in October. Uh, and one of the things that we did was demanded, and so we it wasn't really, it was demanded by the, uh, the meeting, by the audience, uh, which City Council and Navy were represented, was consultation, not notification. People wanted to be consulted, not just told. That seems to be fairly simple. There two very simple things that we had at first. One was a help line, a direct line, to someone that would tell you what's going on. In the old days, the City Council, you would phone up a number of the recreation departments and you would get straight through to someone who dealt with trees and woods. It was dead simple. 
So we wanted a direct line and consultation, not notification. And they wouldn't um, consider any of that. So we then have the, the two day event uh, at St Mary's <coughs> to bring together key people, key activists, speakers, researchers, practitioners uh, from all over the country but the working trust. This is one that they was uh, working with. Uh, Alan Simpson from Leeds Met University, or Leeds Beckett as it is now. Um, Ted Green, Jill Butler from the Asian Tree Forum and a whole host of others came together. And this provided a platform for people to exchange news and views and to, to network. And one of the things we were trying to do is encourage the different communities, different groups to work together. We recently had a second one of these this, this October at Brennerside with Sheffield uh, Professor Chris Baines. And Chris is a really good person because he knows about trees, he knows about water in cities, he was the advisor to John Prescott uh, in the previous government, and he's one of the pioneers of urban ecology, almost single-handedly kick-started the urban wildlife movement in the 1980s. And he's a Sheffield, so that's good. Um, from what has been going on, there's, there's really no winners. Um, there's a huge amount of effort gone into this. And one of the negative things about conservation um, is that very often you only don't lose, if you're successful in conservation, you often just don't lose quite as much as you might have lost if you're really good at conservation. If you weren't good at conservation yourself, it's kind of it's how much you lose. Um, a huge end of this, and it's, yeah, it's absolutely appalling what's happening. Um, I did write a little book which was described as profoundly depressing, so <laughs> you can see where some of this is coming from. Uh, I mean, it's, it's not, this isn't Sheffield, by the way, this is just a picture I was able to drop off the internet. But the way that um, some of the incidents have taken place, that people have been arrested, that police have been brought in. Um, and people have felt intimidated and bullied and harangued uh, and are in looking court, and it really is, is appalling. And it's completely void, you know, there's no need for this to have happened. Um, Western Road, this is another one which is cracking up, it's been in the Guardian recently. And I was first, this was drawn to my attention by Robbie Ridley, who used to work for South Yorkshire Forest and also with the Wooden Trust. And this is an avenue of trees planted. Um, to mark the fall of the first wall, and they're going to clear them. And you just think, well, these are healthy trees. Surely, as a society, we value all this. We, we can engineer a way around it. You know, it's just so unbelievable. Recent events have included a letter from the Central Labour Party to Council Leader Julie Dawe, <coughs> person who's on the uh, video. That's on my blog, have a look at it. Um, and Labour members saying how poor they are by the way that these things have been handled. They, and they finish with, you know, their negative reaction is widespread. Are we fed up of having to apologise for what's going on? Uh, and we're losing members. So, yeah, kind of big issues. I have to say, overall, very few politicians come out of this very well. Um, as we heard earlier, it was a Lib Dem contract, but then enthusiastically embraced by Labour. And really, the, the root of the problem uh, is the long term customer provider services and support. And this has been particularly bad for the Northern Metropolitan District. And the, the way that the cuts have been handled has not been uh, equitable across the country. And people are very upset. And the reason when we started to, this campaign started to emerge across the region, one of the responses was, well, it's just an in this year, it's not my backyard time to it's not. People are genuinely traumatised by what's been happening. At our, one of our early meetings, I had people in tears, you know, grown men in tears about ornamental cherries and almonds. It wasn't even big trees, they were just, they were just traumatised. Uh, one family who had to leave their house for two weeks because the, the children well, they were so upset by the trees being felled. So the council then reluctantly and very belatedly apologised for getting some of this wrong and handling it badly. They're still not saying that they've got the strategy wrong, they're saying that they've actually handled it wrongly when they turn up at people's doors in the early hours of the morning and knock on the door and say, if you don't want your car, um, 
been in trouble. It's not good. <laughs> Um, so I have a look at the, the video clip from Robert McDonald on my blog, uh, which gives this more graphically. Um, it's very upsetting when this is on your doorstep. And you can replant a tree, but it will not be a big tree for a long time. Now, one of the interesting things is that the media seems to have not really picked up on it yet. Uh, and again, all of this transcript uh, from Dee Pichetti passed on to me is on my blog. Um, and this is the thing called the Elliot Report, it's a consultant's report, which was used to underpin the decision to start tree work. And this was uh, back in 2007, and meant in part the contract, the Irish contract, uh, 2009. <coughs> and the backdrop to that is that the highways, the ecology of the highways, have been appallingly neglected in the city for a very long time. And I understand the financial constraints that are reflected in that. But they commissioned a consultancy for Thinker Based in New York to come and look at the highway trees. And since then, this report has been used to justify what Amy and the council have done. And the first thing they did report has actually come to me and said, well, I didn't say that at all. I mean, by quite an early stage, um, I think in the first year they've already felled a thousand trees. The uh, stag group uh, estimated that about four thousand had been felled. And Elliot apparently recommended that a thousand trees would be required felling across the whole city over the period, with an additional 240 ones being crown and used or considered for felling if that didn't work. So 35,000 street trees, he says 25,000 required no work at present. But he thought that some of the need of remedial treatment, that's management. And one of the issues over the last 20 years is this has stopped managing these trees. So it stopped doing the regular routine maintenance that um, averts more catastrophic problems. So the authors then come to me and say, did I tell them they needed to remove half their tree stop? No. Did I tell them 70% of the trees were near the end of their life? Which has been trotted out loads and loads of times. No, I didn't. Oh, okay. That sounds like it's a bit of a fork you've been told to me, huh? So, did I even suggest that 10,000 bits of tree work were urgent? No, I didn't. So, that to me is a big issue because this report has been misquoted and misused. From my point of view, I think Amy, when they signed the contract, failed to do due diligence. This contract, as we'll see in a second, is worth about £2.4 billion. And they didn't check what policies, strategies, or other constraints there were on the work that they were about to undertake. And I would also suggest that the City Council, now lucky senior planning and strategic advice on these issues, also failed to step into the contract or to raise the name. So Amy said to me, no, never been told that. I didn't ask how many told them. Um, and of course, Amy would have done things differently, probably, but they would probably have charged more. <coughs> so again, it comes down to money. Where are we in terms of joint and thinking, in terms of city development, climate mitigation? You know, so we've got all this stuff with uh, trees being removed. We know all your everything you need, everything which is another thing about you know, the hottest summer on record, the warmest winter on record, the most catastrophic flooding. Blah 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 blah. And he just goes, oh, this is Sheffield, by the way, uh, courtesy of Christine Hanley. That's the River Rother flooded a few years ago. Um, and we're supposed to have a, a holistic approach to uh, resolving all these issues. And I would have thought that mature street trees were very much a part of that. Oh, no, they're not built into any of it at all. So, what about green corridors and flood risk? The idea of slowing the flow, roughening the catchments. This is 2007, Flood of Tears. That actually is not the River Don, that's the main road down the Don Valley. Um, no, it appears that all this work is done in complete isolation in terms of any joint of thinking whatsoever, which is remarkable uh, because I thought it was all supposed to be nicely joined up. There's a huge amount of interest in about pollinators, biodiversity pollinators. And if you can kind of zoom yourself up like one of these drones we've got, 
this canopy of trees. And look at the world. It's been kind of look at the world from down here. Look at the world at the level of the tree canopy. And you'll see it rather differently. You'll see how the whole landscape is joined up by these fantastic trees. Stand under a lime tree in summer when it's in flower. Now, as two is a downside to this, because you will get honeydew, and the residents say, Oh, I've got honeydew all over the car. I'm sorry, well, let's just don't make car under a lime tree. I know it's easy, but um, yeah, it is a problem. But in terms of the benefits, stand under a lime tree in summer, and you will actually hear it buzzing because it will be full of pollinators. It's probably far more important than all the gardens in our paper that are put together, one tree, in terms of the actual volume of pollinator habitat. And uh, pollinating insects, such as bees, deliver about 153 billion pounds worth of ecosystem services to agriculture per year. I think Douglas has a thing on his near his desk that says, "Like with, with bees, if we're going, we're taking you with us." <laughs> and yet, there's nothing in terms of thinking about, oh, these trees might be important. So all this stuff about policies or pollinators, et cetera, et cetera. But um, it's okay, we can cut the trees We looked at public-private partnership, um, and that offers some benefits, but obviously, I think for the guy that I probably don't agree with all of those. Uh, but we are, you know, we are in that situation. However, the agreement for this particular project is primarily highways, so the highways maintenance of New York. And I'm absolutely certain that the trees were an afterthought. They were voted on and they were not given due consideration. So there's no reference to existing commitment strategy or policies. There's simply very little in the way public or professional consultation before this was signed. The value is about 2.4 billion and I've been told it's made up of uh, a PFI grant from government, uh, SC, SCC contribution over the life of the project. And the initial tree maintenance budget was quite high, it was about nearly three quarters of a million pounds a year. Now we're now locked into this project and this contract for 25 years. And so one of the problems seems to be that it's, it's uh, in, invariable because both sides hide behind the other if you want to try and change it. We're working on sorts of things, but now we're locked in saying for 25 years, uh, we can't change it. And I have written about that, so I, I'm not going to go on about it in detail, but you can uh, access the big green one in our, our line, it's too expensive to buy. But it does talk about the issues of loss of service and the economic cuts. Um, and part of what I've argued is that if we have people in place at the right level, in the level of property, problems wouldn't have happened in the same way. And the industry wants to book those reviews and be depressing. The evidence is incontrovertible, but it's a depressing look, and I can't possibly use this for teaching uh, uh, school students because they shouldn't be exposed to this sort of thing. It's too negative. Um, if you just had a senior concern planning officer at a high level in the authority, they were reluctant and said, You cannot sign it. Huge additional cost as a consequence of that omission. Just the court case that went up was about hundred thousand pounds, and all the other delays, etc., etc. I mean, how much did it cost to turn the police out at you know two or three o'clock in the morning? Um, massive, massive additional costs because we haven't got someone there. And someone's making profits. <laughs> I'm not going to get too political on this because I have a particular view, but uh, um, there is an issue of public private partnerships and fat caps. And I get passionate about this, people get passionate about trees as well. And what's happened has an impact on Sheffield PRC, it has an impact on our economy, it has an impact on people. You know, that's a tree avenue due for uh, removal very shortly in Mearsbrook. And yes, the road is in a horrible situation, you know, the condition of the pavements have been really bad. But the consultation is kind of, there's a question I sent out to householders, and it's so biased and loaded. If it was one of our undergraduate projects, it wouldn't be acceptable. And it's kind of saying, well, do you want do you want streets with homes and hollows and pit or do you want trees? <laughs> what do you wish, which do you want? Yeah, so. and well, you can have both. 
How do we know that these trees deliver huge ecosystem services and that benefits the local economy? Um, but it also, these trees uh, stimulate inward investment. They are good for Sheffield PLC. This is the London Eye Tree Survey. I think I've put a link up on my blog as well. You can find this, you can find it on the internet. Just a search on Google. It's a wonderful little tool to help you value um, the contribution of trees. And it was done for London. And it shown that they deliver 126 million pounds per year of pollution to the local. It's a massive thing in London. They deliver 2.8 million pounds per year of uh, flood prevention and uh, water management. They store 2.4 million tons of carbon. And they, that's the equivalent of 26 billion vehicle miles. There's much more, have a look at it. I mean, the report gives you in great detail what trees give back to London. It's not been done for Sheffield yet, but it could be. There are some lessons, and I've been asked to go and talk to local authorities elsewhere in the country and to organisations elsewhere in the country, and to work with the tree industry and tree professionals. Um, processing communication, it's been lousy. It has been appalling. There are huge issues of local authorities and public sector now lacking in skills, knowledge, and commitments. You need champions in the authorities to deal with these issues. There are problems of not doing, doing due diligence in contracts, which you know, if we're doing public private partnership, we need that. But you also need people on the local authority side capable and competent of dealing with those issues. Uh, with a major private sector partner. You have to remember that the private sector partner is there for the bottom line. They may do it, they also convince, and I know people who work in these industries are committed to living the service, but at the end of it, the whole point of the private sector is that it's the bottom line. So we need people in the public side who can actually balance that and come to that as professionals, and I think they are lacking those. There's a whole issue about the value of high-waste trees. You know, they are massive and they have been under-recognised. <coughs> I've talked to professionals all over the country who look at Sheffield and they profoundly disagree with what's been done here. These are the tree offices and other properties, and they just say we wouldn't do that. The value of high-waste tree offices. And again, I've talked to some other projects where the tree offices themselves were privatised at one point, and then some other projects they've been brought back in because it's found that the service was actually better and more efficient and more cost efficient uh, by having them in house. We can see the cost of failure at all these levels. It's been absolutely catastrophic. And that's setting aside the personal, emotional upset that the campus people have. Experience. There's a whole issue about long term versus short term issues. I'm an environmental historian, I didn't want to talk long term, I talk centuries. So, you know, we're not here for the, the, the short, we're here for the long run. Um, and what we're doing, as Dave Dunn has said in the video clip, is just not sustainable. It seems, I think awareness has been raised considerably in the last few months, but it seems that there's a lack of awareness and knowledge from the highest level to the lowest when these contracts were agreed. We are seeing a loss of key skills and limitation of local community, liaison, etc. And just the way that the, I hate the best bit say consultation, but the interaction with the community was carrying out really was very poor. And having worked in countryside services and similar services in local authority, when you do community engagement, particularly with groups who are from maybe the less educated, less affluent parts of the city, you need good trained people with really good skills, not someone going in bullying them. And I'll not repeat some of the words that have been given to me um, about some of these meetings, but it's been totally if you're dealing with a community, you have to facilitate, you have to engage, you have to uh, listen and reflect. And it seems that we haven't had that innovative. 
which is about opportunistic, short-term middle children's approaches, uninformed and often unneeded. We've been announced as quick fix solutions to long-term problems. And some of these are very much long-term problems. There's a loss of long-term vision, strategies and commitments. There's a lack of proper process, environmental impact assessments. Was there an impact assessment done on this project? No, there wasn't. What about landscape sensitivity assessments? Not that either. Lack of consultation, loss of effective environmental democracy. And a very big thing, homes are these trees. Now my view has always been that the city council is the custodian of these trees for the community. They're our trees. We elect and pay for the council. We are employed mainly by the council. They are ours. You know, the trees are ours. We are their customers. And I think we deserve a little bit better. So, just to draw to a close, um, one of the good things that's come out, I think, is the, um, the recognition, if you like, and the awareness of concern in the community and a whole host of people coming to us, champions of the community. So we've got Dave Dunman there, uh, who's very involved with the SAG group, the Shepherd Trees Action Groups, and then Paul Selby, who organised the Never Edge, uh, White Matter Hair Speaker, and Alan Tree Day. Now these people like start and then they're really uh, taking a the lead, they're engaging people, they are battling for something that they believe absolutely passionate to be in. Huge issues of engagement, of education, <coughs> training, involvement, participation, empowerment, responsibility, quality of life, heritage, biodiversity. And all those members of list are things that we talk about all the time. In our lectures, we talk about them. When we are dealing with the media, we talk about them. There's loads and loads of policies and strategies. Uh, you know, there's so much wordage. Which unprovoked art would have said, well, doesn't that amount to a hell of beans at the end of it? And it needs to, you know, it needs to be much more important. And what we do need out there are community champions. We need them at every level, in every area. Uh, and for some districts, that's actually very difficult because some areas are quite resilient, some areas you've got people who will uh, come out and be champions. Other areas of the city, where probably the street trees are the most important green resource, in many cases, because there's not many woodlands or other big spaces, those communities are not necessarily able to vocalise or verbalise their concerns. And yet they are equally needed, if not more. So we need to think about things like that, and we need to go and support those community champions. Thank you very much. a letter and then they were told that you had to do the normal way, go on the internet. They couldn't get on the internet because there was a date before they were allowed access to go onto the internet. 
another gentleman resident on the street came, he contacted um, Sheffield City Council <coughs> and, <coughs> and then they, refer, or a mate, answered his letter and um, he was told that it would take 28 days for it to be discussed. That was eight days ago and the tree is half taken down today. Um, thank God, some every people joined my residence. We managed to cut, call the guy through one of the neighbours who owned the house, and I went and stood under the tree in his garden, and we had to stop work. And we've saved it today. We need an independent person to go tomorrow and give us um, a, whether it's they. Amy would tell us it's dangerous. I've been there till yeah. five o'clock. That's why I'm late. Amy are saying now that they've taken one of the crowns, half of a third of the crown off, that it's dangerous and it will be on our shoulders and blah, blah, blah. Um, everybody at the residents that were there were prepared to take this risk until they've got an independent surveyor to come and say whether it's dangerous or not. Because um, Chris, Chris that was in charge of Amy, he wanted to come kind of in between and cap it all and leave the stump. And then when I said to him, does that mean the tree's dead? He said, well, yes. I said, well, no, that's not good enough. You know, <laughs> you're leaving as a stump, but one that will die. And he said, well, what, after what we've done to it, it probably will anyway. But so it's not going to die after what they've done? No, well, that's what they're saying, but that's why we need an in somebody independent to go tomorrow, because Chris has agreed to leave it until we, we come to an, an arrangement or an agreement with Sheffield City Council and Amy Chiefs and everybody in Sheffield that care to make decisions on totally healthy trees where there are alternative measures that can be taken. It's bricks and mortar reinforcing with steel and concrete. Mm -hmm. You know, I just don't get it. It was a sycamore tree that they tried to take down today, over 100 years old. It's, it's ludicrous. It's ludicrous. Well, these things are supposed to go to an independent tree plan, but lots of times that that just gets to go on. No, because this gentleman was told it would go to a panel in 28 days. Yeah, yeah. Eight days on, they're here at 7.30 yeah. this morning, three with the drains. Yeah. And then the chainsaws are mm -hmm. It's all sleight of hand. It's, it, and that's the point. That's the point we're making today. Hi there. My name is Alan Story. Uh, I made the film Authorised Vandalism. I'm with well, well, um, with made by Well Read Films and Western Road Remembers. We're doing work up on Western Road. My two questions: one about the tree panels. There's a petition going around saying that the tree panels should resign because they're just being a cover, a sham for what's going on. As we saw on Rustling's Road, as I saw myself, they said don't cut them down. Amy goes in and cuts them out. One and all discussion. What do you think, Ian, about having these tree panels resign? Second question is, up on Western Road, there is this problem of the pavement being raised. And you said there was some kind of engineering solution. I'm not a tree person, yeah, I'm a journalist, yeah. a lawyer. Could you tell us a little bit more what these engineering solutions are for raised pavements? Thank you. I mean, very often what we do is this, this we have um, like a metal grid which is put around the base of the tree and as the tree grows, it just pulls any metal grid up with it. So you're not tarmacking straight up to the tree, or you can use a flexible material uh, that's rubberized, and as the tree grows, that just moves. Like flexi yeah. pee? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. Right. Again, yeah. If none of the trees on Western Road are being uh, on the kill list because of the pavement, they're on the kill list because of curb displacement. Curb displacement. Yeah. Plenty yeah. of curb displacement can free for uh, either disease or uh, structural. <coughs> There is this list of, is it the six D's? And if you don't get by one, you can get by another one. Yeah, but I'm talking with you today, because um, that's what we're saying, that this isn't a case of stopping all the trees. The disease one can understand mm. after they Basically, I got the reply that they, they have been dealt with. The, the three, the, the, the you disease, the my question about the three trees on Western Road, I was out there with an arborist this afternoon and they are not diseased and they are not structural dissing you know, problems. They are healthy trees. So yeah, that's, that's, three. that's three of them, yeah. yeah. I mean, in terms of the tree panel, I, I don't have 
not been closely involved in that. I was asked about the Green Commission for Sheffield, and I said I wasn't prepared to get involved in it because I thought it was probably just going to be a facade. That's my personal view. Uh, I wouldn't feel that I can come into detail on the individuals who are on the panel. Um, they're supposed to be independent, but certainly the feedback I've heard is that they are not taken seriously. And your experience would back that up. Research on the effect of art, uh, street lamps on the trees. <coughs> we found they were affecting different species of trees. Could you speak up, please? Yeah, I, what, awesome what I said is that I, I did some research in Chicago on the effect of uh, security lighting on street trees, and we found there that they were detrimental to certain species of trees, and it depends on their distance from the tree, and so on and so on. Well, the Chicago mm -hmm. City, every four years politically, they change the lights for political reasons. And so they didn't care. But fortunately, the research was good enough to stop the city of Evanston from putting them down, from putting the street lamps in. For a couple of years, I've been trying to get that affected here. And the problem right now is even a more major one now, not just the cutting them down, but the ones they're replanting are gonna be dying. Mm -hmm. Not just from lack of water, but the species is, uh, and the type of species and if they're of a certain, they're not maybe able to withstand the climate change and severe changes. And that is my worry is I, I don't like them cutting them down. They shouldn't, I probably, I think I know the person who said I'm, I love trees and then I cut them down. You hear the same thing from the arborists who are cutting them down. We love trees, but we're, it's our job and we cut them down. And there are big issues there that I don't want to go into, but really it's, it's a major, major thing but not just for this city, but for the <coughs> entire UK. Fortunately, other cities have changed and they're not putting in the lights, that, the LED lights that um, Sheffield <coughs> is putting in. They've stopped. But for one re reason, once again, eight, about seven professional bodies have said, don't put these specific type of LED lights in. Sheffield City Council is ignoring them. So, Somebody asked which cities then? Pardon? Somebody asked which cities? Which cities? Oh, it was New York uh, uh, and uh, Arizona and Bristol 
I better mention one from the UK or you'll think I'm just a, an alien. <laughs> so there's those and there's more. If you want any more information, you, I'm sorry, I'm not asking a question, but I, I'm making a, a really serious statement here about even though they're saying they're for the future, no, they're even making it worse for the future. Mm -hmm. That's the truth. Pardon? The truth. Yes, they won't give it to you. I've asked them, when I call them and try to get in, they tell me, oh, we'll send you, there's contradictory evidence about what you, your Richard's done. I say, please send it to me. Okay, we'll send it to you. I've been waiting for two months for that. They're not going to send it to me. But if anyone wants any information, I, I'm sorry, I don't mean to impose, but I get away with it because I can say I get away with it. And I have a, I have a flyer if you want to get that before you leave. But thank you very much, Ian. Okay. One last question if anybody's got one. Ian. Two questions then. Gentlemen and Matt first. With regard to Leather Edge, where you've got large swathes of a similar tree species of a similar age, it's very much an engineered woodland landscape. What would your strategy be for you know retaining that whilst adding some diversity both in age and in species? I think the strategy has always been that you would if, if there are trees that are dead or dying or a problem, then you will remove some of those um, once you've exhausted the other options, and then you will replant those with the appropriate species. And then obviously there's a big issue at the moment of what those species might be with things like climate change and with things like disease. Um, for some of these situations, the problem isn't as acute in terms of timing as you might think, because the Taylor Elm tree works out. That could easily live another 100, 150 years. So you've actually got quite a lot of leeway in terms of time for that. Um, I think at the same time, looking at other areas that you, where you can start to get trees into the population, maybe green spaces or in gardens, to diversify the age. Because if you've got, got Victorian suburb or an Edwardian suburb, there's a danger that you've got a whole bunch of trees which will age together. Um, I don't think that is as acute as we've been told. I think the Elliot report we're now says I did, I never said any of that. But it is new, a new plan long term for a strategy of diversification and appropriate management, etc. Et I think my focus would probably more with regards to disease prevention and the spread of disease. Certainly in Nether Edge we've seen evidence of bisophorus yeah. that, which you know can move quite quickly for a tree population. So it was kind of you have got essentially a monoculture there, haven't you? Yeah. yeah. You've got a, uh, and really, whilst it's great, it's a green canopy and it can provide these ecosystem services, no doubt about it, it could succumb at some point to a disease which would wipe it out in one attempt. Yeah, and I mean, with extreme weather conditions, any more likely to get uh, diseases coming in in the future. And part of what seems to happen, really, we've lost quite a few sweet chestnuts. Um, I think in the, the late 1990s, early 2000s. But they probably started to go down in the 1976 drought. And it took 20 years before they actually succumbed. So you need to be planning. You need really good professionals, in my opinion, within the local authority to care for this. With community champions, you know, with the diseases, we need to make better use of the community and actually being out there as you know, the eyes and ears for the professionals but working with the professionals, not the conflict that we end up with, which is absolutely, you know, it's such a waste of time and energy and effort. To what end? You know, it's disastrous. There's a question down here. Yeah, um, if, Ian, if, if someone actually gave you... Speak up, please. If, you, if someone actually gave you leadership of the Sheffield City Council this week, what would you do? <laughs> to, to actually solve this problem. Yeah. Could you repeat the question, Speaker? Yeah, um, if I were somehow the elected or nominated as leader of Sheffield City Council, what would that be my strategy? Um, I think they've got a real, I mean, they've got such a serious problem because they've got themselves, they've painted themselves into a corner with a contract. <laughs> That's the problem. So the contract. Yeah, so we've got a 25 year contract. And when I talk to either side, each side hides behind the other saying we've got a 25 year contract. Mm -hmm. And 
probably the only sensible way to deal with that is to get in a room and you know be dallying through until we sort it out. So that contract so, is is that that's, contract visible at the moment? Is it? That's the uh, highways maintenance contract that the city council and Amy entered into, and it's one of which I gave the some of the financial figures. I don't know is that contract publicly available, David? Do you know? No. no. You see, the problem is once you've got a public-private partnership, all the things that, which is why I was harping on about environmental democracy, which I'm passionate about, um, suddenly all these things that we've been told are in the public domain are not in the public domain because they're mostly sensitive. So even me finding out how much it now costs to maintain the roundabout at Meadowhead, which I know is dead easy because it's on a piece of paper somewhere, or it's on a special somewhere, I can't get access to it because it's confidential and mostly sensitive. And even colleagues who work at city council couldn't get it because it's commercially sensitive. So I suppose that's that's my get at is that until I've seen the contract, I don't really know what the heck I would do. I you know we are locked in an, an agreement with Amy and I think they need to have the least bit coming together. And you know we've heard some of the our body portraits the work for Amy will say they're passionate about trees, and they probably are. They just have a different take on their approach to the contracts because they have a different paymaster. They have some other objectives. They have another bottom line as one objective. So, you know, it's, it's glass half full, glass half empty. You know, you get two professionals, you can have two different views. So, I, I, I'm sure that the Amy professionals are very passionate about their trees. That doesn't stop them from, you know, in some situations, actually inappropriate management. So I, my view would really be, assuming that we're locked into this, we can't get out. Um, there is no sudden extra amount of money, although they have lost a lot of money on all the legal costs and everything else that happened, and all the contractual delays, so it's in their interest to sort it out. I think you have to get everybody into a room. Almost where I started when I went to see Amy back in 2013 in the summer, and you sit down until you've actually sorted a way of working with them as the, the contractor delivering the work on behalf of the city council, but on behalf of us as the, the customer. We are actually paying for this. Even if it's borrowed from some other part of government somehow, we are paying for it. And if it's a loan, then loans require repayment and interest. So, you know, we are the customer. We should actually have um, a big say in this. Which is why at the end I was asking you know, which trees are these, because as far as I'm concerned, they are our trees. Um, the city council are the custodians, elected and paid for by us. So I would want to get everybody back together to say, look, this, you know, we have to have a different way of operating. And some of it, yes, some trees will have to go. You know, I've worked in the urban area for many, many years, I understand that. But if you're going to do that, at least have an easy phone number to someone who is confident, who can explain to somebody reliably what is happening, why it's happening, when it's happening, rather than where you say, you know, oh, it'll be consulted on in 28 days, and then they arrive a week later and cut it down. And now the tree's going to be felled because they've cut half it off, and what's left is dangerous. They say that, but we don't yeah. have that. Yeah. Uh, if anyone wants to do something practical now, our illustrious chair, seven days ago, set up a petition to say Western Road trees and to force a debate in council. As of a few minutes ago, we were 4,700 online signatures, 300 away from the magic number. We've got 200 paper signatures. No one leave until you sign this petition, please. <laughs> it's here. If you want to do something, come and see us. We've got some leaflets. Thank you. For okay, thank you. And if you go onto my blog, there's loads of links to all the different campaigns. There's lots of things that you can do. There's lots of things that you need to do. Um, what we've achieved so far has been through absolutely dedicated individuals working beyond the pale, and they have achieved a huge amount. Um, and we need that happening across the whole of the city. Hopefully now, politically, you know, the letter from the Labour group, things are starting to change. And we may see a, a willingness to do things differently. But at the end of it, it's down to you, us, to do it.
Wales. Ian, would you um, would you act as a like a mediator between the council and our group? Just if they they send it back themselves into a court, yeah. would you be would you be willing to do that? I'm always willing to try and help. Yeah, because it looks like this is the only way. Yeah, I'll, I'll be prepared to help. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for coming. I appreciate you taking the time. Did anybody mention the rally tomorrow? The rally. Yeah. 12.30, rally at the town hall, please be there. Do take away the free books, take away, give away the Christmas presents, and also there's the cards and the other prize. Thank you very much, have a safe journey back.